and it looks like you've fallen asleep. So here's a little something to wake you up. Ah! Wake up! Hi guys, welcome to another episode of This Meyer Show. Um, today, what we're going to be re reviewing is Chapter 10, Lesson Three. So that is going to be starting on page. Mm, wait, not that one. Page three eighty two. So I'm gonna basically uh, tell you, teach this to you over the uh, phone, which is my phone, and video it. And it's called the Miss Meyer Show. So for those of you who do not know what the Miss Meyer Show is, it is a really famous YouTube show. <laughs> We've got like a, a whole ten followers or whatever. And this is where I will teach you stuff that I don't have time to go over with you in class. So we call, it's been doing this, gosh, for, golly, at least four years now. So the Miss Meyer Show has been pretty, uh, for a long time. It's been uh, in syndication, it's not in syndication. I guess it's in syndication if you say that you go back and watch old episodes, which I sometimes have done. And then I'm like, oh my gosh, look at my glasses, look at my hair. Look at <laughs> so I really try not to do that very often. But okay, so now we're gonna be talking about lesson, chapter 10, like I said, unit three. This is the big issue with what we're talking about. Okay, so the thing is with this one, thank you, this is blue, everyone, this is, he is, uh, jumps up right in my lap and wants to get involved with everything. He's my smelly cat. He's the one that farts all the time. He's a stinky boy. Yes, you are. You're a stinky boy. All right. So let me get off poor Blue. Get out of the way, Blue. All right. So we're going to talk about first is in 1981. And this is the year that I was born was 1981. So it shows you how old I am. But in 1981, Louisiana suffered an extremely big economic setback. And what that was is that it was a just an uh, economic setback. It was kind of, it wasn't a depression, but it was where a lot of people were losing a lot of money. And one of the reasons that Louisiana had ha was having this economic setback was because the price of oil was really, really dropping. Now that made a big difference in Louisiana because we had put so much emphasis on the oil companies here in, in the revenue that we got from them. See, a lot of other states in the United States, um, they were using other sources of revenue. So what is revenue? Revenue is when you get money back, when you have a service or you deliver something, you're gonna get, you're gonna get money back, money that comes back to you and that is called your revenue or your surplus. Well, in Louisiana, we had a huge problem, economic devastation, a big setback because of the falling oil prices. The oil business was huge in Louisiana. It was huge. You had, um, I'm trying to look because I don't know numbers offhand. Uh, let's see, you had, in 1980, 40% of all the state revenues came from taxes on oil and gas. Now, once the oil prices lowered, we had a problem because that meant that tens of thousands of people would not have were not being paid as what much they as 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 much as they once were. So it was kind of like supply and demand. When you have a high demand of something, you're going to be paying less because you have more of it. And when you have a excuse me, I should say fix that. I'm totally confused. In 1980, between 1980 and 1981, the price of oil decreased dramatically. And when that happened, when they, you know, that what it meant was, oh, you're making me crazy. This is what when it ha meant was, is that people were paying lower prices for oil. And because companies and, you know, states and all this kind of uh, companies and even overseas, so they were paying so much lower for this oil, the oil companies were not able to pay their employees what they usually paid them. Now the oil business in Louisiana is very profitable and it, it, it was for a long time. But during this period is when we see a really huge slump in the price of oil. So the oil companies that are, you know, getting, sustaining the oil, drilling it, cleaning it, doing whatever they do, I don't, I don't necessarily know. They couldn't pay their workers what they were paying them. 
and some of them were even laid off. They had lost their jobs. And the problem was, was that these people that were working these jobs, they were having less money. When they were laid off their jobs, they weren't getting any money. They were getting unemployment. So therefore, they had less money to spend in the state of Louisiana. And when they had less money to spend in the state of Louisiana, they had much less money going into other businesses. So other businesses started to suffer. So in the beginning of the 80, uh, in the 80s, that you know time, time period, it began with a lot of economic turmoil for people. I remember my mom saying that my dad was always laid off and that he was always trying to find work when I was a baby because it was the economic cult, uh, atmosphere in Louisiana was terrible. And he was always trying to just do anything to get some money and to bring it home. Now, well, one another big problem that the whole economic downfall with the oil business was that a lot of people were leaving Louisiana and they were going to other states and other places that had a more uh, profitable future. So they were like, okay, well, I guess I'm not going to make it in the oil business. I'm going to go move somewhere else. I'm going to do something else to another state. So this made it so that, you know, uh, kind of like a brain drain you had a lot of people leaving the state and when they left they took their you know talents and whatever else they had they took that with them and they were gone so the whole oil industry started this kind of movement away from louisiana so because of this because of the consequences with the oil bust and the problems that it was causing in louisiana we needed to find another way to um, increase our revenue as a state. We needed to find some way to kind of get that money back into Louisiana. Because Louisiana, unlike other states, we had always believed that the oil business was just whoo, profitable. It was always going to be great, just like the Great Depression. We always thought it was going to be perfect and fabulous, and we didn't plan for what would happen if the oil industry burst. So when the oil industry did burst, we didn't have anything to fall back on. We had no way of getting any more revenue because that was what we put all of our eggs in that one basket. Our whole you know, focus was the oil industry. And now it was just plummeting, it was crumbling. And these people were scurrying around trying to find work, trying to find money. And Louisiana, who depended on the taxes on the oil, they were like, well, how are we gonna get money? If we can't tax the oil, because nobody's buying it and it's so cheap, how are we going to fund the state of Louisiana? How are we going to run schools and hospitals and roads and pay our politicians? What are we going to do? So Louisiana really had to find another platform, another gimmick or another way to get money into our state. Well, <laughs> all we had to do really was not look too far because Louisiana in its uniqueness and its very beautiful uniqueness, people were always interested in us as a state. So this is when the state of Louisiana started to turn to tourism as the number one source of revenue for the state of Louisiana. And it's still that today. But hold on, let me get closer. So we had the revenue coming from tourism. Now tourism is today in Louisiana the most profitable way to that we're bringing in revenue, but it always wasn't like that. And one of the reasons it's like that now is because we have really resourceful promotional people that really promote Louisiana and get people to want to come here. So the big problem was is that we needed to not just encourage people to come here during Mardi Gras, we had to get people to come here all throughout the year. And we had to appeal to different types of people. You know, not everybody wants to go to Mardi Gras. I, I, I don't. You know, I've been to Mardi Gras so many times, it's not something that I would want to do. And I would not bring my kids to certain, you know, parades and stuff like that because it's just not kid friendly. So I'm not going to go, well, I'm a, you know, I'm a native Shalmatian, but to say if I was just some regular old Texan and I was looking at, let's go visit New Orleans, I wouldn't want to go during Mardi Gras. So Louisiana had to find a method of getting people to come to Louisiana throughout the year and appeal to many different types of people, not just people that are like, yeah, I want to go get drunk and, 
you know, hang out in the French Quarter. You had to appeal to all kinds of people. So the tourism industry in New Orleans was really ingenious because it, it appealed to everybody. You had your Mardi Gras people that wanted to come and just have fun and do all that. So yeah, that was a big promotion. But they also started promoting the wonderfulness of our food of just how great it was. The food was just better here in Louisiana. It was better than anywhere else. And I can tell you guys, based on just Texas and wherever else I've been, that no one can cook like a Louisiana person can cook or a Louisiana lady can cook. I'm gonna tell you straight up, there is no one on this earth that cooks better than my aunt who is from down the road in Louisiana, okay? Hands down. She cooks the very best, better than anybody, better than anything I've eaten before, better, 100%. So they were using food to be like this lure, like, hey, you know, you wanna co co come on, I wanna taste this, let's go to Louisiana, let's eat some crawfish. Uh, one of the first things that people uh, meet, you know, my husband and myself and my girls, and they say, oh, you guys are from Louisiana? We say, yeah, we're from New Orleans. <gasps> can you make us some jambalaya? Can you make us gumbo? I'm like, yeah, I get Tony Sashri's. <laughs> Here's the box, there it is. And they think it's the greatest thing ever. When in all actuality, I'm a terrible cook. I really am, I don't have the patience to sit and wait for things to cook. So I just kind of give up on them. And once I smell burning food, I know that it's done. That's, that's my method of cooking. So they think, oh my gosh, she can cook so well. And it's like a box of Tony Sashries or a bag of beans in my crock pot for like a couple of hours. But people are, uh, just connect Louisiana with great food. So they assume, oh wow, she must be a great cook, which is totally not true. And be, because they are, this is, that's, that's because of our promotion, of how we promoted our state. How we were saying, oh my gosh, Louisiana is the plethora of good eating. And so when people hear Louisiana, after they hear, think of Mardi Gras and like all those other kind of festivities, they start to think, wow, you must be a really great cook. Boom, that goes to the tourism industry. And that would have never been, you know, uh, promoted the way it is and the way it was had the oil industry not plummeted. Another way that the tourism industry was really promoting itself was in promoting us as a sportsman's paradise. Oh, come to Louisiana. Hey, if you don't want to come for Mardi Gras and you don't want to come for the food, come for the wildlife. You can hunt and fish and do all kinds of things. We've got crab season and shrimp season and crawfish season and, you know, we could go all these other kind of places. People were hunting in the marshes and in the swamps and all over in the bayous and it was a big deal. And just the area, the, the wide, vast area that we had available for people to hunt made it very, you know, a, a big, big draw to the tourism population that was coming here for wildlife activities. Well, then they said, we've got to find a way to really get people here that want to spend money. So when you do like, when you're promoting Mardi Gras, you're really promoting it to a younger crowd, I guess, I would guess. That's what I see. You know, whenever they're saying stuff about Mardi Gras, what I see in Texas, it's always young people you know, having fun on, in, the, in the French Quarter, throwing beads off of the balconies and having drinks in their hands. That's what I see. So uh, you, these people though, they're young. And when you're young, you're not gonna make a lot of financial purchases. You know, the most money they probably spend in it is on liquor. So, and hunters, you know, gosh, if you guys know any hunters, they don't spend money on hardly anything because they're gross. My husband, when he hunts, is gross. He just brings like a pair of clothes for like two days. They sleep outside sometimes. They like, oh no, we're not gonna bathe or use aftershave or deodorant because it's gonna, the deer are gonna smell it. I'm like, oh, I'm so glad I am not with you. Let me just say that, I am so glad. And then to make matters worse, he sprays himself with something else to make him stink even more so that he attracts the deer. Don't ask me. Um, they have asked me if I wanted to go with them maybe, you know, with some other wives while we can go hang out at the camp. I said, I'd rather eat glass, really. I, I would rather sit here with a plate of glass and eat it uh, rather than go spend two days with a bunch of stinky men. No, thank you. But anyway, so the, the, the wildlife, you know, uh, tourists, they're not going there to spend a ton of money. They're going there to get 
animals to go deer hunting or whatever. So we needed to find a way to get people to this this state and to spend money, big money. So I don't know about y'all, but in my house, there is only one person that kind of holds the reins to pretty much everything in this house. And I'll give you a hint. It's not my children or my husband. Okay, so if I'm gonna, we're gonna make as a family, we're gonna make a big financial decision. Guess where the buck stops? It stops right here. So like that big TV that we've got in our living room, that's because I, I wanted it. You know, I like to tell, he, he thinks, and he'll shh, he thinks that it was like a birthday present for him, but it was always because I wanted it. That's why we got it. Okay, and I wanted it for those of you who have not seen other Miss Meyer shows. I wanted it because it's really big and clear. And I wanted to watch Gone with the Wind on it. <laughs> so, that's why we bought it. I was like, my husband's like, you're so wonderful. I was like, I know, but it was always with an ulterior motive. <laughs> So let's keep that on the shh, if I don't say anything like that. So anyway, so like most families, I controlled big de the financial decisions. So they wanted to appeal to people that were going to seek out the uniqueness of Louisiana culture. And this is when they decided to start really promoting Louisiana's beautiful, you know, uh, our agriculture. Ag ag why do I keep saying this wrong? Ugh architecture the buildings the plantations the histories the haunted history tours remember i told you guys that the whole um chloe deal that's a fraud it's not true so if any of you go to that myrtle's plantation you tell them that your history teacher said that they are a fraud and that never even happened because it didn't but anyway there still is a big tourism industry people are like i want to go tour the the, the estates and the plantations. I want to go tour all the plantations, okay? I would like to do that. I have never been to some of the ones, the really beautiful ones, like Natchitoches. I have never been. And I would love to do that. So they were start, starting to kind of appeal to that certain crowd of people. And a lot of times, it's mostly, you know, if you go to any of these places, these big bed and breakfasts and uh, huge, beautiful homes. I guarantee you, there's very few men that are there on their own accord, okay? Because I guarantee, I'll tell you this, if I told my husband, oh, we're gonna go to Louisiana, maybe see some friends, but on the way there, we're gonna stop at this plantation, this bed and breakfast, he's gonna be like, do we have to? But he'll go because, you know, like I said, I uh, hold the <laughs> So, anyway. So now Louisiana was finding a really good way to bring in lots of money that they had once thought that they were never gonna recover because of the big oil crisis. So tourism is like the number one way that we're, we get money as a state now. And it became that way because of the oil bust. And the next way that we started to get more money was even more you know, play. It was even a bigger play. I shouldn't even say even more play because that's bad grammar. And you know how I feel about that. Okay. So this was also a play on tourism. They saw that people were willing to spend money here if we gave them reasons to spend it. So this is when in the infrastructure in New Orleans started to try to appeal to a large variety of people. We see the children's museum, the aquarium, um, big improvements on the Audubon Zoo. We had the World's Fair here in the 80s. We, you know, updated Canal Street. We did the trolleys. Uh, oh my gosh, I have been in Texas too long. I just called streetcars trolleys. That's crazy. The streetcar. I've been here in Dallas too long. Before I know it, I'm gonna be saying like, yeah, I'm gonna go get me some soda and I'm gonna go feast my friends over the Galleria because that's how the kids sound around here, except for Vivian who uh, has a, a country twang. I don't, I don't know how, but she does. The other ones are sound like the Valley Girls. That's how they sound. So I apologize. Mia culpa, mia culpa, okay? So it is a streetcar. They redid the streetcar system. They made it really, they did the, flowers and the gardens around City Park and different things like that because they really wanted people to come to New Orleans to stay for a long extended trip and to spend money. And they wanted them to spend as much money as they could. So they decided that they were going to come up with a lottery, okay? Now what the lottery was, the lottery was basically 
uh, you bought a ticket. This is what it still is today, really. You bought a ticket and for every, you, know, you bought a ticket to win a jackpot. So let's say they were first saying, okay, buy a dollar ticket to win a $10,000 jackpot. So you just need to spend $1 and you could possibly buy, win 10,000. Well, what's a dollar? You know, right? I mean, for real, for a lot of people. I know a dollar is, you know, sometimes my kids are like, can I get a dollar app? Like Katie, the other day she came up to me and she's like, can I get this dollar app? And I said, well, what is it? You know, what's the rating? That's I was really worried about rating. And I looked at it and she's like, oh, it's it's uh, four and up. So I'm like, okay, I guess it's not that bad. Do they have, you know, whatever. I just check some things. Mostly for parental, you know, security. Nothing really to see content. So she bought this app for a dollar, which was my dollar. And it is a translator so that she can translate what she is saying into cat. And um, when I tell you it was the most, the biggest waste of money that I have done in a long time, it was this. I mean, even though it was just a dollar, I was like, I cannot believe I spent a dollar on this stupid app. I was like, it doesn't even work, Kate. You know, so, but whatever, she believes it. I don't know, but anyway, so, you know, that's like pfft, blowing money away. But a lot of people feel that way. They're like, oh, what's a dollar? So they'd buy this lottery ticket and they would take the lottery ticket, they'd go home and then on the news, there would be this, they would do like a, you know, a, a, like a video, or whatever, come on after like the 10 o'clock news and would be like your big Louisiana lottery drawing. Like they still have it. I'm sure, I haven't seen it since I've lived there. We don't have one in Texas. Not like that. So, but you know, anyways, it is. And so what they would do is they would just pick numbers because your lottery ticket would have a bunch of numbers on it. And this machine would randomly throw out numbers. And if your numbers match the l numbers that machine was throwing out, then you would win the jackpot. And it would say like, oh, I'm so excited. And people would buy it again and they'd buy more and they'd want them bigger chances. And this is the beauty of the lottery system was that because for every single lottery ticket that was bought for a dollar, 35 cents of that lottery ticket went to Louisiana and they used the remainder of that money to build up the jackpot. So if you've got, you know, let's say 10,000 people that are playing the Louisiana lottery, then you're gonna get a huge amount of money back from those people in lottery sales. And that's the way it was just making a big difference because more and more people were playing the lottery. So then they started having a pick three and a pick four and a Powerball and all these different types of lottery games and the same thing was happening. You buy your ticket for a dollar and then money comes back to you. I don't know how many of you guys, but I can remember my grandfather he would buy like pick threes like they were this long and it was all these pick three numbers I was like how do you even focus on what you're doing and he would like strategize you know because I used to work in a convenience store in Chalmette long long time ago and we would work and like get the, the numbers out we would say like oh you know people would come and they would get uh, I want to pick three and then I would just randomly pick the numbers like doo -doo 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 -doo. but my grandpa he was like really just like hmm and like making a big think about it it's like oh my goodness and he, I don't know if he ever won if he did he he probably just shoved the money in his house somewhere because he didn't uh, believe in banks and things like that so who knows so now Louisiana is making really good money you know we're getting stuff from the lottery uh, from the, the pick three, from the Powerball, we're getting money coming in from tourists, we're getting money from uh, people coming here for sightseeing, for wildlife, for Mardi Gras, for all kinds of the culture, the food, everything. This is where tourism becomes this huge, huge, huge industry. And it almost makes up for what we lost in the big, you know, oil fiasco. Now, this is one of the things that, you know, goes with Louisiana hand in hand was people were interested in coming here because our politicians were so colorful. They had such vibrant, you know, just out of the box ideas and they were just so out there. Now, in my opinion, none of them have ever been kind of as crazy as Earl Long, but they all, there were some that were just notoriously corrupt and just plain out bad that people were always kind of fascinated by Louisiana politics. Now, it started with Huey Long, of course, but after Huey Long, we've had string after string after just all kinds of just, you know, interesting politicians. 
So at this time in the 1990s era, you know, that's when I was in, gosh, I graduated from eighth grade in 1995 and I graduated from high school in 1999. So 1990s through 99, I was in that middle school, high school kind of area. So I remember this very well. And this is the time of Edwin Edwards. Now, Edwin Edwards was extremely charismatic. And what does it mean to be charismatic? Charisma is when you're very likable, you, uh, you know, you, you're a great storyteller, people like to listen to you, they want to be around you, they like your company, and all these other kind of things. That is charisma. When people just, you know, want to be around this person, because this person is just something, somebody that just makes everything seem better. John F. Kennedy had a lot of charisma. Bill Clinton had a lot of charisma. Um, Edwin Edwards also has a lot of charisma. These are things where people are just drawn to them. So Edwin Edwards, as charismatic as he was, he was shady. He did a lot of things kind of underhandedly. And he decided that, you know, you know, he was out of office. He was our governor for a while, and then he was out of office. And then he decided he was going to run again for governor. And, of course, you had some people that were saying, no, no, Edwards, because he's corrupt. He has his hands in too much of the lottery. You know, he was shady a lot of underhanded things but along comes his opponent his republican opponent and it's none other than david duke now some i lot of you guys probably don't even know who david duke is but i remember when my mom and dad found out that david duke would be going against edward edwards they were livid they were like what is this i can't imagine oh my gosh david duke was once uh, a member well he had identified as being a nazi he was the founding member of um, the national advancement of white people. He was a leader in the Ku Klux Klan. He disliked African Americans, Jews, organized laborers like unions, didn't like those, liberals, um, welfare recipients, anybody like that. He didn't like any of these people. He only liked Caucasian people. Okay, that was it. And so to my parents, who were both, you know, uh, one was Hispanic and Asian, here comes this guy who's running for governor of Louisiana and straight up saying, oh, I don't like, I don't like Jews. I don't like homosexuals. I don't like immigrants. I don't like Catholics. I don't like union members. All of this. And this guy was like running against, he was seriously, he wasn't just somebody on the outskirts. He was like actively running for governor. It was either Edwin Edwards or David Duke. And the people, Louise, the whole world was like, oh my gosh, I cannot believe this is happening because this guy is straight up there on the platform. He's, you know, he's a Klansman, you know, come on. And so Louisiana was just like, oh my gosh, something's gotta happen, something, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Well, thankfully, David Duke did not win and Edwin Edwards was now the governor once again. Now, this is the problem. Edwin Edwards just couldn't keep his hands out of the, the lottery. He was so charismatic, and he made friends with everyone, including the wrong people. And so he thought that he was going to make a little personal money on the side, and he was going to start making legalizing riverboat gambling in Louisiana. It's kind of like... Um, Gosh, what was the one? There's one in Kenner. I can't think. I used to go to that one. I don't like casinos. Let me tell you why I think they're a waste of your money. Because you really are going to blow your money. It's all a game of chance. It truly is. And the house always wins. So my husband, we don't do this ever anymore. I mean, there's a, a casino in Oklahoma, but we've never been. I'm not going all the way to Oklahoma. But anyway, when we lived in New Orleans, I remember our friends would be like, hey, let's go to Harris for the weekend. I'm like, oh, I would no way. I don't want to go. I'd rather keep my money. You know, but anyway... This is when Edward Edwards is really a big purport, a proponent for riverboat gambling and all these other kind of things. So there were all these riverboat casinos popping up. I know that there, I can't think of the one that's in Kenner. Larry! Yes, I need to have a question! I have a question! You would think that I'm, I like this one. What was the name of that casino in Kenner? The treasure chest. The treasure chest. 
That's it. Are you gonna put that okay, in? yes. Okay, so there was the big treasure chest, and then there were some others. I can't remember. Oh, oh, Boomtown. I think that's on the West Bank. Oh, those. Okay, so that's what they were doing. These big riverboat kind of casinos, and everybody kind of wanted to start one. All these companies were like, "Hey, let's go to Louisiana. Let's start a riverboat casino." And they were all in a race to get these contracts from Edwards. You know, so he had the, he held the cards, and he was like, "Well, who am I gonna give this contract to?" So what he did was, you know, he started accepting bribes and kickbacks. You know, companies that would say, if you let us have this license to operate this casino, we're going to give you $5 million. And he was taking it. Well, hello, Edwards. Get, a, get your brain in your head. He, of course, he was found to be corrupt. And it was all exposed. And Edwards spent, was sentenced to 10 years in jail. In, like, federal prison. And then when he came out, he got a reality show for, like, a hot minute but still I mean come on now so now this adds on to just another Louisiana governor now this one spent time in federal prison like seven years I think he got ten years but I think he spent seven so oh, eight he spent eight so that's the 90s the 90s are a time of just turmoil and then we've got all these you know the governor race and we've got all the like, riverboat casinos and louisiana's just got all kind of people coming here and it's also the time when people were like calling the ain't the saints the ain'ts like instead of saints they're just called the ain'ts and they would put like paper bags over yard signs that said like saints or whatever because it was just hating on the saints it was the era of jim mora um, gosh, and who, Nash Roberts on TV. So this was a big era that I remember when growing up. Now we're going to start to talk about moving from the 1990s into the 2000s. Well, initially, besides everybody worrying about Y2K, basically that was, um, idiotic. Okay. So it basically said that the computers were not, uh, programmed to go to 2000. They were always in order to save space. They had always just used two numbers, 99, 91, 81. Well, they didn't think that eventually we're going to have to go to four numbers because we're going to go to the 2000s, you know? So they thought that there was going to be this huge, like, technological shutdown and machines were going to go, the beds would stop working and the banks would lose. I mean, it was just nuts. You had people that were really, really crazy about this. Well, anyway, it was nothing. Y2K was Y2 junk and no one suffered. I'm mean, Not that I ever know of. So when I was a freshman in college, I was like, Y2 whatever, man. <laughs> so, but in the 90s, uh, excuse me, in the 2000s, we had big changes as well. And one of the greatest and the biggest and the one that affected my life the most, probably the biggest effector of my life, was Hurricane Katrina. So in 2005, August 29th, 2005, Hurricane Katrina slammed into Louisiana. And when it hit, it hit as a Category 3 storm. But it was initially a Category 5, which is the highest you can go. I remember we were in Chalmette. My husband and I, we had just bought a house in Miro, Louisiana, right outside of Chalmette, by Lexington Place, around right around there. And uh, we had a little girl. She was a year old. She was, like, starting to walk and stuff like that. And I was like, what are we going to do? Because all of a sudden, um, Ray Nagin got on the news, and he said, "You need to, this is the one that we've been warning you against. This is the one that they're telling you to get out. This storm is a killer. Get out. So I'm like, oh, my gosh, Larry, we've got to go. So we took our dog who was a puppy, kind of like, the, he was a lab. So he was the, and the puppy stage where his legs were like really long and his, like, he was just all legs. And then we took our baby. We took half a bag of dog food, because that's what we had. We put everything into one suitcase, because we thought, oh, we're not going to be gone that long. Because gosh, how many times have we had to evacuate over the years? And um, we left. We were going to Dallas, because my cousin lived here. And we all know what happened. Katrina completely devastated New Orleans. And in St. Bernard, it destroyed us. It destroyed every... St. Bernard was just gone, okay? It was unbelievable. When we returned, our house had been hit by a tornado. It had been hit by oil. It had hit by mud. It was just... And it wasn't just our house. It was every other structure in the entire parish. It was everything. There wasn't one thing that was... I mean, everything was gone. It was just... In an instant. So when Katrina hit, this is when you start to see this huge shift in Louisiana. Because before Katrina, 
Everybody in my family lived in Chalmette. And everybody in my husband's family lived in Chalmette. Everybody. We were um, like two streets away from so and so, and we everybody was like close to each other, and they were always talking. It was just really just close knit community. Well, when Katrina hit, you know, my husband and I we moved to Dallas. We lived here for five years, then decided to go back to Louisiana, and then you know permanently came back here. Um, my uh, fam family members were starting to move all over the place. I have family members in Mississippi. I have family members. Uh, were we all in Chalmette? Now they're living in Slidell. They're living in Harrisburg. They're li not Harris is it Harrisburg. Hattiesburg. Harrisburg. Oh. They're living in Poplarville and Mandeville and Covington and Slidell. They're all over now. You know, we're the farthest because we're all the way in, uh, you know, the ta Texas. But we were separated. And not only did families separate, but people left. People left Louisiana. They were scared. They were like, I'm not going to go back to this for this to happen to me again. So you start to see people moving to other states for better opportunities, for jobs, for things like that. And that's what my husband did this last time. Um, the first time with Katrina, I mean, we obviously we had nowhere to go. Our house, we didn't have flood insurance. So you can imagine how we weren't getting any money for that. So we had to kind of start over here in Texas. And when we were, went back to Louisiana, he got a call, was offered a, you know, a nice uh, job here in Texas is why we came back the second time and this was continuing to happen more and more people were leaving Louisiana to find work elsewhere and this was a big problem it didn't help that almost less than a month later Hurricane Rita comes along and hits us again so while we're trying to uh, you know to recover from Katrina we get hit again by another massive hurricane. So the people of Louisiana, Southern Louisiana, Chalmette area, that not, Lower Ninth Ward, Plaquemines, this is all where it's like, boom, this stuff is gone, okay? These people are having to rebuild from nothing. And a lot of people, they stuck by it. They said, you, I'm gonna stay here to the end. I am no, I mean, not going anywhere. You know, my parents, they lived in a FEMA trailer for a oh, long time because they refused, they weren't going anywhere. They refused to leave, okay? You know, uh, other people said, I'm going, I'm sorry. Younger people that weren't so tied down with roots said that I can't go through this again. And for us personally, as a family, we made that decision when our, you know, daughter who was two by then she had turned two and you know, was too afraid to even bathe or go into a swimming pool she was paranoid that she was going to drown so i was like you know we just we can't do this and so we decided as a family to stay in texas a lot of people did probably people in your family too that may live somewhere else because of katrina you know and so that's just one of the big big impacts that Katrina had on us and continues to have on us is that we have lost a good bit of population after the storm and because people left they wanted to find somewhere else I always say this um, and it always it's extremely true I say that you know what in my heart I am a New Orleanian I'm a Chalmation I'm a Louisiana girl straight up you should see my house I have to give you a house tour one day after I make everybody clean it, usually it's me that cleans it, but it, uh, one day I'm going to have it like a, know, a big old fit and make everybody clean the house. Then I'll give you a house tour. So in my house, though, everything's Louisiana. I've got Louisiana themed everything. Big Mardi Gras posters are hanging up in my living room. And there's just been, uh, you know, Mardi Gras themed, not just Mardi Gras, but Louisiana, themed, New Orleans themed. Everything's all over here in New Orleans. So I am that at heart. But I'm so fearful that to go through that, to lose everything again like that, is that I just, I'm scared. And so my husband, you know, we live here because this is where my husband's job is. And, but you know, we're, we're Texans and of course we consider ourselves Texans, but we're always Louisianians first. And I am never not a Shalmatian for life. Wear my shrimp boots with pride. Actually, I don't have any shrimp boots because if you guys ever, you met me, you know that I'm, a little bit dud, uh, you know, I just don't like, you know, you know how I am. So no, I've never owned a pair, but uh, I did have rain boots that kind of look like shrimp boots. I guess they look the same as mine. But anyway, so we had this big issue with Katrina and Rita that it not only made people leave and not only lessen the population in, you know, as far as people went, it also did two other major devastating effects on the state. The second one being, was that people weren't didn't want to come here 
They were scared to come here. Our tourism industry, after Katrina, you know, it was just crazy. You know, you couldn't come hunting and going, you know, crabbing after Katrina. Are you crazy? People were trying to rebuild their lives. They didn't even have running water, much less anywhere to house hunters. And, you know, Mardi Gras and all that, you had a certain people did come from Mardi Gras. The French Quarter was saved. But it was not with the extreme merriment that it once was. Katrina did a really big number on us with our tourism industry. And then it also did a big number on us with our coastal area. Because the storm surge was so intense, coming from Katrina, coming from Rita, it was washing away parts of the coast of Louisiana. So we just were trying to like just survive to get back on our feet. Well, then comes the BP oil spill. Now BP oil spill was an oil, uh, oil kind of like a, what is this called? I don't know what it's called. It's oil something. It's called, I can't think. It was a drilling. Oh, it's a deep, it was a BP oil spill, Dream Water Horizon. Okay. Well, it was in the Gulf of Mexico, and it was basically like a big drill. They were drilling for oil in the Gulf of Mexico. Well, something happened. It's like a mistake had happened, and all this oil was just pouring out of this big oil well, like all over. And before they could get it stopped, you had a massive amount of oil that was all throughout the Gulf of Mexico. Well, that's gonna affect us big time. Number one, because our tourism is just tourism industry is really big on the Louisiana food. Most of our food is flavored with just the seafood that we have in the Gulf. Well, we can't get that seafood out of the Gulf because now it's totally polluted with oil. The, um, the livestock, the wetlands, the birds, the trees, the alligators, they were all dying because they were all just poisoned and sickened by this oil. So now people, fishermen, a big, you know, group of people that make up Louisiana, they, they didn't, they, they're, what were they going to do? They had nothing to catch. Their whole livelihoods was gone. Restaurants gone. Uh, you know, just all these kinds of things. People were like, oh, everything that my family has been, like I know a, a lady whose daddy was a crabber and then her husband was a crabber and then their son was a crabber and there's generation after generation after generation. BP oil spill happens, their business is gone. They lose everything because there's nothing for them for an entire year. They're scrambling to try to make something happen. So now we don't not folks now blah, blah, now we don't have just hurricanes that are hitting us. Now we have a big oil spill. We've got all these problems and we have people that are just like I had enough. I'm leaving. And we start to see even more people leave from Louisiana. Now, eventually, the oil spill gets cleaned up. They sue British Petroleum, which is the company, BP, for a big amount of money. And they are still trying to use some of that money to clean up the, the Gulf and its damages that it's done. But some of the damages we will never be able to, you know, recover from. Our coastal erosion in Louisiana continues to be an extreme problem. And that's going to make it even worse for us because the coast of Louisiana acted as a buffer. So when a hurricane was coming in, coming in hard for Louisiana, for New Orleans, the coastal areas in New Orleans would kind of hit it first and it would kind of die down. And then it would come and hit us much lesser. Well, now we don't have too much of a coast left. So these big old hurricanes that are coming in the Gulf, coming in the Gulf, are going to slap slap right on into like the New Orleans and all that kind of area. And that's a problem for us. So they've been trying to rebuild the coast, to rebuild estuaries and wetlands and things like that to act as a buffer. A lot They used to use old Christmas trees. Like when a Christmas is over, they collect your old Christmas tree only if it was real. You know, not if you have a fake one. <laughs> Here you go, no. Um, and they would try to build up estuaries and just our coastlands to build it up. And even now you might see old bumper stickers from like the 1990s or whatever come back and resurface as new that say, save our coast. It was, it's kind of like save our lake. It was a whole Lake Pontchartrain thing. Y'all don't know that, I'm too young to remember. But now they're saying save our coast. So what does this whole thing kind of tie into and what does it boil down to? So what it does for me as a Louisianian and um, a proud one at that, uh, it shows me that the one thing that I see in Louisiana, despite all these things, despite all oh, the oil industry floundering and Katrina and Rita and all of our colorful governors and the BP oil spill and all these things that happened, 
one thing remains the same, and that is the people of Louisiana. The people of Louisiana are resilient. They will not give up. They will never stop fighting for a greater Louisiana. They will always be there, and they'll be fun, kind and funny and willing to give you the shirt off your their back. They're going to be great cooks and great hunters and lovers of Saints football till the very end. So while you know nature could, and politics and you know a man or whatever could definitely deal deal Louisiana a huge blow. I think the people of Louisiana are what keep it going and keeping it strong. And so I am just very proud to be one of them, albeit living in Texas. And I'm sure you are too. So that's all that I've got for this episode of the Miss Meyer Show. I will see you in class. Don't forget to come, please. All right. And your assignments and all that will be up on the newsletter for you right there. Oh, adios. Hi guys, I'm here with Pocahontas. So Pocahontas, who's your favorite teacher? Well, I do know a very wise teacher is named Mrs. Myers, and she'd be more than welcome to teach in my village any day. Right? <laughs> Thanks, Miss Pocahontas. See you later. Enough. All right, let's get what you need to know out of the way. Pocahontas, daughter of Chief Poetin of the Poetin tribe, reportedly but probably didn't convince her father not to execute Captain John Smith from Jamestown, married a different colonist named John, and temporarily improved relations between settlers and Native Americans. Now let's really talk about Pocahontas. Mr. Betts is absent. I'm Wadi. I'm your flying squirrel substitute teacher, and you, yes, you in the back of class, don't you try me! They only hired me for one day! I got nothing to lose! In 1595, Matuaka was born. Who's Matuaka? That's Pocahontas' real name. What? Yeah, Pocahontas is a nickname and not a particularly good one. At best, it means playful one, and at worst, it means spoiled child. So Pocahontas was born to Chief Poetin, and we're not sure who her mom's was. And while she was the daughter of the chief, she wasn't really a princess. Poetin tribe didn't work that way. Sorry, Disney. Get her out of the parade. Cut to 1607 and the arrival of the English at Jamestown. In 1608, she meets 28-year-old Captain John Smith for the first time. Wait, if, if she was born in 1595, and that would make her... Uh, carry the math... Uh, uh, oh, excuse me. <laughs> oh, wait, 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 I forgot. That's another Disney lie. There was no relationship between John Smith and Pocahontas. Yes, there's the story about Poatin capturing and wanting to execute Smith and Pocahontas saving his life, which, again, might just be a story. John Smith didn't start spreading this version until 17 years after it supposedly happened. Till that point, he said his time with the poet and people was friendly and comfortable. He also said the same story about a young girl saving him when he was captured by the Turks in 1602. Point is, John Smith was a dirty liar. Well, let's forget about Smith because he would leave Virginia in 1609 when he was severely injured after his gunpowder pouch exploded while he was sleeping in a boat. How does that even happen? Without Smith, Jamestown goes downhill fast, and during the starving time of 1609 to 1610, 85% of settlers die. It got so bad that there's pretty conclusive evidence to suggest that some people started eating the dead. Excuse me. <laughs> it didn't help matters that the anglo poetin relations broke down on account of, you know, the English trying to take more and more land and stealing supplies from the Indians. Jamestown settlers were all ready to call it quits when Lord Delaware arrived. And ain't it fitting that a guy whose last name was War immediately wanted to go medieval on the Powhatan. Here we have the start of the anglo poetin War. Wait, wasn't this a video about Pocahontas? Well, back to her. In 1612, she's captured and used as leverage by the English to get a ceasefire. After a few years in captivity, a peace was declared, sealed with her marriage to another colonial John, John Rolfe. She was converted to Christianity and renamed Rebecca because Eurocentrism. They had a kid, Thomas, in 1615, and the relative calmness brought about is known as the Peace of Pocahontas. Happily ever after, right? <laughs> you must be new here. European and Native American relationships are never happily ever after. The Virginia Company saw Poke, I mean Rebecca, as an opportunity to get some PR after, you know, the war and the death and the salvation and the cannibalism. <laughs> Rebecca's conversion and adoption of European life was one of the few highlights coming out of the New World. So in 1616, the Ralphs were on a ship headed to England. Really? 
She's lucky enough to avoid the diseases brought over by the colonists, so you send her to the petri dish that started them all? She was the talk of English society, even meeting King James. And then she died the next year of pneumonia, tuberculosis, or smallpox, because of course she did. Pocahontas has become a nearly mythological character of early American history. Yes, part of the reason is John Smith and his embellishments. I, I particularly like the time he said he fought 200 Indians with a sword and his guide tied to his arm like a shield. But a bigger reason is that people were all too eager to believe this version of Pocahontas. Pocahontas, the good Indian who left her savage ways and became civilized. Come on, if that wasn't one of the reasons for colonization, wasn't that one of the justifications? Didn't think it would get so heavy when you clicked on the flying squirrel, huh? Well, that's all I got. Class dismissed. Be sure.